Well, I'm Dara Horn. Um, I wrote this book, Guide for the Perplex. It's my fourth novel. Um, but more relevantly to the program, I was a fellow in 1994, and I'm really thrilled to participate um, in this program in Edgar Bronfman's memory. Hi, can people hear me now? Yes. Hopefully. Yes. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to thank everyone for introducing themselves. Um, and just as a bit of context and background about um, the opportunity that this webinar is presenting. So as all of you know, Edgar Bronfman, our founder and visionary um, and really leader, um, passed away a little bit over a month ago. Um, and as is Jewish tradition, we set up sort of a bunch of different mechanisms for Bronfmanim all around the world to learn together. Um, which is what we do best and also what we do in someone's memory and really what Edgar was a huge um, advocate of. So one of the opportunities that we gave people was to choose either poetry or Mishnah um, or a book uh, to read on their own and then to learn together with the Chavruta. And one of the books that we offered was Dara Horn's wonderful book, A Guide for the Perplexed, which I had the great honor of reading a couple of months ago. Um, and so this is the first in a series of three webinars where we're going to be featuring um, the authors or someone who's a leading force behind the, the research and the material that we've been talking about. And really just to hear from Dara and to open up the conversation so that we can learn together, which is, again, really in the spirit and the memory um, of what Edgar really loved and what I know all of us on staff and those of us who had the opportunity to do with Edgar really appreciated. So this is really very much in that spirit. Um, and just to briefly introduce Dara, Dara is a VYFI alum from 1994, and she's a novelist and a literature professor. She got her PhD in Complet from Harvard, and she's the author of four books who all have very different kinds of interesting Jewish themes, including In the Image, The World to Come, All Other Nights, and The Guide for the Perplexed, which is her most recent book. Um, and other than that, she lives in New Jersey with her family, uh, with her husband and four kids, I think I have right. And we're just yeah. really honored to have her here to talk more with us about her book and the journey behind writing it, writing it and the ways in which um, we can kind of weave our own stories into it. So thank you, Dara, again. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I, don't, should, I, I was wondering if, we, if you want to start with people's questions or if I should just sort of give an idea of uh, some of the ideas that motivated the book. Up to you. I leave it to you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, well, I think let, let's you know so, since it's a uh, limited time, let's start with uh, people's questions so that I can focus on what's of most interest to everybody on the call. Dara, maybe just from our experience, better to for you to start us off, and then I'm sure we'll pick up on there with questions. Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, well, so I. When I this is my fourth novel, and um, all my novels, uh, as you mentioned, deal with themes from Jewish history and Jewish culture. And yes, okay, just people joining um, with Jewish history and Jewish culture. And in this novel, there were a, a few, and, and so there were there were some things that I do in all my books, and some things that I was particularly doing in this book. Um, in and actually, I would say this is sort of, in, in a lot of ways, motivated by my summer in, in Bronfman, which is, I, I often have felt there's this sort of a sense of inauthenticity in American Jewish life. And and the way that, I, what I concluded after in studying um, Jewish literature in Hebrew and in Yiddish was that a lot of that feeling of inauthenticity that we have in American Jewish life is because of the lack of a Jewish language, because this is a huge Jewish community in world historical terms, but it's not a community that uses a Jewish language. It's a community that uses English. So there are many ways that people sort of have responded to that that uh, situation um, by pressing language onto people and this kind of thing, and I didn't see that as, as terribly effective. And what what interested me was the possibility of English becoming the Jewish language. And so one of the ways that I've sort of, in my work, facilitated that or tried to facilitate that is by writing novels that are written in English as though English were a Jewish language. And what I mean by that is that every language has an archaeology of belief that's built into it that native speakers don't necessarily hear. Um, when you say to somebody in English, you know, this will happen for better or for worse, you're not thinking, oh, I'm quoting the Anglican marriage ceremony. Or if you say to somebody in English, go the extra mile, you're not thinking, oh, I'm quoting the Gospels. But of course you are, 
And this archaeology of belief is built into languages, and it, it, it surfaces like every time somebody sneezes. And in reading literature that was written in Hebrew and in Yiddish, I became very jealous of these writers because these were writers who were writing in sec- writing secular stories, but who were writing it in a language where those kinds of echoes of ancient beliefs were built into the language itself. And so what I've tried to do, whether successfully or not, I don't know, is to bring those kinds of echoes into works that I write in English. So I'm writing stories that are not sort of outwardly religious. In other words, they're not usually taking place in a religious community or something like that, but that where the sort of the structure of the story and the language itself is drawn from ancient Jewish texts. And that idea that ancient Jewish texts are something that is accessible to everybody is something that I very much learned from the program from that Edgar uh, Zikronoli Vacha created, this idea that you know, that this wasn't something that just belonged to somebody who was living a, a, a traditional life or that this wasn't something that just belonged to, you know, a guy wearing a black hat or something like that, but that this was something, or even that it belonged to somebody who had mastered these languages. Because while I do speak Hebrew and Yiddish, obviously many people don't, but that, that these were texts that were, that were accessible to everybody. Um, so I wanted to sort of bring those texts into the, te- into the story. So in this particular, so that's something I've done in all my books. And in this particular novel, um, I was doing a, a, a several different things, and I can talk more about whichever ones of them are of interest to, to all of you. Um, one thing that interested me was the Joseph story from the Torah, um, the the Joseph narrative and what the questions that it raises, not just about sibling rivalry, but about fate and free will, about how much control we have over our circumstances, how much of our lives are, are somehow destined or, or beyond our control in some other way, and how much of our lives are within our control. And so I was exploring that question um, throughout the book. And then the other ele- main element that I was interested in was, and this is something that's sort of become a... a a live element of people's lives in the past five years or so is the omnipresence of the digital world in our lives. And, you know, we think of this as kind of a hyper-modern problem, this kind of constant data dumping that we always have and this ability we have now to record everything that goes on in our lives and the, how that puts us in some ways that are removed from, from our real lives. And I was interested in looking at how new or old that problem was um, I knew about the history. I knew about the Cairo Geniza. Um, I wanted to include that story as something that was a way of testing the story's hypothesis about memory, and to see um, and to sort of push that to the limit of what memory really is and how it differs from history or a collection of evidence. So that's you know uh, some ideas of what I was going for in, in creating the story. Um, so maybe now we can uh, focus a little bit on what uh, aspects of the book interested you. Sarah, this is Becky. Um, hi. One of the hi. One of the I mean, one of the things that, as you just mentioned, the the, the digital age and um, you know the 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 confusion that that brings in a lot of senses. And and so one of the things I I was thinking about a lot when I was reading your book is the role of the Geniza, um, the actual concept of a Geniza. And um, as you're as you're just sharing as well, this question of modern Jews who perhaps um, are creating in some weird way their own kind of personal Geniza with with their emails or <laughs> or or just a, a you know a disordered saving of everything. Um, and and I and I'm curious to some extent just how you or what more you've been learning about or thinking about in relation to the traditional model of a Geniza and when you think about um, modern Jewish communities that are not actively involved with traditional texts, um, whether there's some sort of very variation on the Geniza that you've imagined as, as a future place, you know, aside from the virtual one that, that uh, was in the book. <laughs> Yes, um, it's a great question. Um, I want to say first something about um, the issue of technology changing memory, and to just point out um, that this is, you know, this is something we think of as like a very new problem. 
Um, but it's actually a very old problem. And um, actually, uh, Plato has a book, uh, The Phaedrus, in it's one of the dialogues of Socrates. And in this book, Socrates is complaining about how technology is changing memory, because now we have this new technology called writing. And now that we have this new technology, it's going to destroy people's memories because, you know, who's going to memorize the epics of Homer now that we can just write everything down? And if we don't have that kind of comprehensive memory ourselves, then, you know, what, what is the soul and what makes us who we are? And so, you know, the truth is he was right. I mean, nobody does memorize the epics of Homer. And also now we no longer memorize our friends' phone numbers either. So, uh, you know, it is, it is a real question, but I, I want to, in bringing this up, I want to just point out that it is kind of an old question and that Jewish uh, culture kind of also is subject to this in terms of beginning and transforming with the technology, that this is something that happens in Jewish civilization with the idea of the Torah being a written text and then there being a tradition of an oral Torah, which was a sort of ongoing argument and commentary on the Torah, but then that oral Torah also gets committed to writing in the form of the Mishnah and then the Talmud, um, or the Gemara, the completion of the Talmud, or the, you know, the, the sort of body of, of oral law, that becomes a written law and then becomes sort of by, in many, in many situations, you know, treated as, as, as a written text and, um, and revered in the same way that the Torah is revered in many ways. So that is sort of a, you know, that question of how we, how technology changes the way we remember things is a very live question. But I think that your question is something a little bit significant, because, uh, significant in a different way, because the question about what a Geniza is, um, and I should say, first of all, that the, the Cairo Geniza was weird. And when I say it was weird, what I mean is that the, traditionally what a Geniza was supposed to be was, was a repository for sacred texts. And mm-hmm. not just, you know, and sacred texts being specifically not just like, oh, something that feels important to me, but rather very specific parameter of something that mentions God's name in writing. So you weren't allowed to discard any document that had God's name on it. So that that was sort of supposed to be what a Geniza was. It was a way of managing damaged texts and damaged texts that have God's name in it. Um, it was a storage, a Geniza means a hiding place. It was a storage space for these texts before they were buried. I mean, you were supposed to bury these texts, and the only issue is you were going to not just bury, like, one piece of paper. So there was an effort to accumulate material so that then you could actually, and they would be buried like a, with, with, with a funeral, like a person. And I should say that this actually, this is still a live issue in Jewish life because um, I'll say that I live in New Jersey. Um, I guess I should have said that when we went around, although maybe somebody said it. Um, I live in New Jersey, and um, last year when our state was damaged uh, very dramatically with Hurricane Sandy, there were a lot of um, synagogues that were flooded and damaged. And you can imagine when a synagogue is flooded, you have a lot of Cedarim and prayer prayer books and other books and Torah scrolls that are damaged beyond and can't be used. And they actually, there were, and in New York it happened in communities like this where they did have burials for these documents. But in New Jersey, it's actually against the law. Um, The EPA in New Jersey created a law that you can't bury something that's not a dead body. And I think this was intended to prevent people from burying toxic trash or something like this. But Actually, the, the last I had read about this, which I don't know if it's been resolved, but there were like 70,000 bags of garbage bags full of prayer books that were left on the side of the Garden State Parkway that were just being just waiting for there to be some kind of decision about what to do. So this was like a wide issue. But what I think your question is asking more is about um, sort of the secular modern Geniza, meaning this digital concept of us recording everything as, you know, with the software in the book or, frankly, with the kind of software we already have. Um, right. The difference... I'm sorry, yes? Yeah, no, that, that, yeah. Yeah, so the difference, I think, is a difference that I feel is the the major difference between Jewish and American culture. Um, Jewish and American culture have, there's many important similarities between them, the importance of law um, and various other things, but I think that um, the major difference to me between Jewish and American culture is that American culture is all about the individual, and there's we have this you know the founding mythology of America is that it doesn't matter where your parent who your parents are it doesn't matter where you came from it doesn't matter who your what your background is what matters is what you do with the opportunities this country gives you and how you make yourself sort of a self-made man or woman without a past right I mean that's what we call the American dream but if you think about the foundational 
um, legend of Jewish identity, it's the idea that when God gave the Torah to the Israelites at Mount Sinai, that it wasn't just that generation of Israelites who were present, but that all of those descendants of that generation of Israelites, meaning all of us today, were there physically present standing at Sinai to receive the Torah from God. I mean, if you think about that, that's like the opposite of the American dream. Because what that legend is saying is that, yeah, it does matter who your parents are. It matters who your great-great-great-great-grandparents are. The most important thing in your life and identity happens thousands of years before you're born. There's nothing you can do about it. So to me, the American Jewish identity is about the tension between these two possibilities. Um, and I think, but what I want to say, though, is about the Cairo Geniza was different from a traditional Geniza because it wasn't just documents that had God's name in it. They had the custom in the Cairo, medieval Cairo community of preserving anything that was written in Hebrew letters. So what that meant was it wasn't just things like prayer books. It was things like grocery lists. It was things like kids' homework. It was things like sales receipts. So in a sense, like, this wasn't an archive. Like, this was like the medieval Facebook. And it was crammed with so much mundane junk that you can kind of reconstruct an entire world from it. And so I think that, in a sense, what I see is similar between the two, although ours is very individualistic and you could say very narcissistic, I think that both are motivated by a sort of a core element, which you could say is a Jewish idea, but I think it's, um, I, I think it's really a universal human idea, which is really a, a concern with mortality. Right? I mean, there's this idea, and you know, perhaps it's appropriate to talk about it this, you know, uh, event for Edgar, in, you know, after Edgar's death. Um, but I think it's a fear of mortality. It's, you know, I mean, you know, the ancient pharaohs used to bury people, you know, bury their, you know, their, they would bury, bury in these tombs where they had models of everything that they wanted to bring from one world to the next and images and texts representing everything they wanted to bring with them to the next world. And I think a lot of what we record online are these things that are essentially fleeting, right? I mean, I used to always wonder why people put pictures of food online. Um, you know, like when people are showing you a picture of, like, this is this dinner I just made. I always used to think, like, why do I need to look at this person's dinner? And what I decided is that, you know, because this beautiful dinner that somebody spent all this time making is very quickly going to become a pile of dirty dishes. And I think a lot of what we record online are those fleeting moments. I mean, that's why people put so many pictures of their children online, right, because this crawling baby is going to soon start to walk. And, I mean, those are those fleeting moments that we want to preserve. And I think we have this idea, and, again, I don't think it's necessarily a Jewish idea. I think it's a, a human idea that if we somehow can preserve those moments, that somehow they can remain preserved in this metaphysical space beyond time. And I think that's perhaps why we call it the cloud. So that was a really long answer to a really short question. I'm not even <laughs> sure if I addressed what you wanted to uh, address, what you really wanted to know. That was, that was very, very interesting. No, definitely addressed a lot of facets. Other questions? Sarah, Sarah this is Donna. Um, Hi. I was, I was fascinated by how you used um, Maimonides, not just as a character, but, but also as, um, you know, you, you brought, him in, brought in his philosophy in a, in a very bold way, I think, you know, for a novel. Um, you don't see that a lot, and, and I just wanted to say that. And I, I also just wanted to... Um, so I've I've worked with Edgar and and Edgar had a real affinity for Maimonides and um we actually studied together some of the passages that you that you brought up um particularly the ones that have to do with the concept of God. Um and maybe you could just talk a little bit more about that why you choose you chose to bring it into the book this way and and how you know relating back to what you said about a Jewish language um, what role that played for you? Sure. Um, so the in, including the Maimonides, you're right. I mean, it is kind of a bold move, and I'm sure there, are, you know, and there are, there are definitely are readers who come to this and they're like, okay, let's get back to the kidnapping plot. <laughs> um, um, so you know, there's, there's, you know, it's perhaps not for everyone, but I, I do, I, I, I do try to say you're a 
your publisher um, is terrific. I mean, like I, I can see other publishers being like, this, this is too heavy, you know. But, but um, <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you. Well, I will say, actually, there is something that I cut, not at the publisher's request, but I decided it was too much. Um, there is a whole backstory that I initially included in this novel um, that's about the lives of the uh, Josie and Judith's parents. And that I did cut because I felt like it was a little too too tangential. But I am publishing it in April. It's going to come out as an as a digital book. It's uh, like a prequel. Um, so I'll you know I'll put out a notice when that comes out. But that's yeah, it's going to be um, it's like about you know it's a short it's like 50 pages, but it's a, a prequel to this novel. Um, so I didn't you know I didn't include everything. I wasn't totally indulgent in including everything. Um, well, so what I would say about Maimonides is, you know, first it was, you know, what what made me, the initial idea of including him was just because of um, the Geniza, because, I mean, he's, of course, it's, you know, he's the most well-known person whose work is, appears in the Geniza. Um, but then the content of his work was, was very interesting to me, because, you know, when you think about, um, you know, this is a person who was living in the 12th century, and I think that um, as actually a, a friend of mine who was also a Bronfman Fellow, Becky Weiss also was in the fellowship in 1994. She's a, a software developer, um, and she, I remember talking with her about this book, and she said to me, she says, you know, but the 12th century, it's like, that was such a long time ago. Like, pe- they, weren't, they didn't even really have people then. And it was that remark I thought was very telling, because I think it tells you something about the way we think about the past, first of all. But while well, it's true that, you know, perhaps in other parts of the world this was, you know, a kind of a dark ages, what I thought was very resonant about Maimonides' time, and not just him, but his time, and him as a product of his time, is that 12th century Cairo was not the dark ages. 12th century Cairo was the tech capital of the world. This was a place that was at the crossroads of a global economy, that science is cutting edge. I mean, this is a place that felt, to me, very familiar. Um, you know, this was a civilization that was on top of the world. And what you have in this setting is people who are asking the same questions that we are asking, because they, like us, are, you know, are in a position where they're at the frontiers of human knowledge. I mean, we can sit here and laugh about, oh, they believed in, you know, leeches and the music of the spheres or whatever. But, I mean... God willing, people will be laughing at things that we believe, you know, in a thousand years. And I think that what's interesting is the way that living in a sort of scientifically minded culture really motivates my and, and Maimonides himself being a scientist. I mean, this is an, uh, this is another thing also that I should say, like, since I'm talking to Bronfen Fellows and parents of Bronfen Fellows, another thing that interested me in this in writing this book was sort of this kind of the the problem of the the intellectually gifted person. And what I mean by that is not, oh, woe is me, no one can understand my genius. What I mean by that is the arrogance that goes along with um, an intellectual gift. And that was something that was of interest to me. Um, it's something that, and something that I, I went back to the story of Joseph, too, because Joseph in the Torah is really, I mean, and he's presented as a tzaddik, as a righteous person in the commentaries and the way that, that he's looked back upon. But if you look at the text itself, Joseph is a person who is presented as talent. He has a talent, okay? I mean, he has, you could call it a divine gift. He has this ability to predict the future. But he's also an arrogant person, right? I mean, because he's given this gift of being able, so he has this dream that he predicts the future, that his siblings and parents are all going to bow down before him. It's one thing to have that dream. It's another thing to then go tell your siblings about this dream. You know, one of those things is a divine gift. The other one is a choice of how you use that gift. And so I was interested in the sort of play between intellect and arrogance, and, and also the way that Maimonides' philosophy in particular directly addresses this question. Because what Maimonides says in, his, in, in Guide for the Perplexed, I mean, he says a lot of things, but he sort of talks about divine providence, the way that God protects us, as being through a divine gift of intellect. Which, in other words, that God doesn't send down a miraculous cure for a disease, which, you know, Maimonides was a doctor. He knew that this wasn't happening. But the way that God would, the way that God protects us is by giving us the intellectual capacity to discover a cure for a disease. So, I mean, if you think about this, I mean, there's a few things. One is that, I mean, it's, it's an odd kind of belief in God. Um, it's a very, um, I mean, and there are more than one ways, there's many, many ways to read this book, obviously. And one of the interesting things about Guide for the Perplexed is it kind of is a mirror in that when you read it, 
it, it can reflect back to you what you wanted to say because of this enigmatic way that he wrote it. And so that's something that's interesting to me that, you know, there are people who are atheists who find this very resonant, and there are people who are very, you know, not, not just believers in God, but very mystical believers in God who find this very resonant. So it's sort of this strange thing that he's able to achieve in that book where he creates, he creates kind of a God that atheists can be comfortable with. Or not even just atheists, but people who don't necessarily feel a kind of a mystical connection with the spiritual world. He creates a kind of a God that that is that is a very it's a very rational idea of God, and that was interesting to me. And I will say that you know um, you know my own personal beliefs vary very greatly at different times in my life, and it was and I, and each time that I've read Guide for the Perplexed, I've it's meant different things to me, and which is true also, I think, of, I mean, that's why we keep reading the Torah every year, because the book doesn't change, but you do. And so I was interested in the way that Maimonides was able to, you know, it felt very resonant for modern people, for secular people, or not necessarily secular people, but for people living in a secular setting. Um, and by the way that he, you know, and by the way he sort of, challenges in the book, in Guide for the Perplexed, not in my novel, but in Guide for the Perplexed, the way my, that Maimonides challenges the, in, 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 while living in a culture where it's all about discover, making discoveries and, and pushing back the boundaries of human knowledge, he makes an, an argument in his book for humility. Um, by, and the way he makes that argument is by saying that God is in a sense, is well, the essence of God is unknowable. And what that means is not that it, it, it doesn't mean that God is here and God is, but but we can't touch Him. What it means is that even saying that you know anything about God's presence is, in a sense, a kind of idolatry or arrogance. And it was that claim that I think made it, that made it to me very resonant, um, especially in our digital age when we believe we live, or at least we live in a culture where it's believed that all problems have solutions that we are just we just need to apply ourselves to discovering those solutions. Um, and also where we're living in a culture where there's a new vogue for belief in destiny. And what I mean by that is not just that destiny, um, you know, that for Maimonides, this question of, um, you know, whether or not we can control our destiny, for him it was a question about, it was sort of a philosophical idea of if God knows everything, then how do we have free will? You know, but today, that idea of our lives being predestined is something that's very present in secular culture, not because people believe that God is directing their lives, but they believe that their lives are predetermined by, I don't know, brain chemistry or genetics or laws of evolution or things like that. So I feel, I feel like this question is a very live issue in contemporary life. I'm hearing a lot of feedback, and I'm just, I want to make sure that everybody can understand, can hear me, and that I can hear everybody else. We can hear you fine. Just if everybody's okay, not with their phones, it might help with that. Okay. That was another really long answer to a really short question. We like those. <laughs> okay. Well, right. This is Brosman, right? <laughs> it's never multiple choice. So this is Radzova, and I'm, I'm really interested, you know, as I was reading your book, there's so much about Egypt in the news, and I was wondering what it was like to be writing about, I, I mean, I know that it wasn't you know, directly related to current events in Egypt, but writing about something that is unfolding so fast, while then also using these historical documents that are kind of done. I mean, was that a hard juxtaposition to you? Things were all changing, or how did you handle that? Yes, and it was, I was very, very nervous about it. Um, I will say that, I mean, I started writing this book before the Arab Spring, like before the initial revolution, and um, I was actually kind of annoyed when they overthrew their dictator because I'm like, now I have to change my plot, <laughs> right? Um, so, which was perhaps not the most empathetic way to look at current events. Um, but what I realized, though, is that this gave me an opportunity to confront this amazing historic moment when – you know, one of the world's oldest civilizations suddenly is forced to face this free new world where everything was going to be on the record. Um, and I mean, this is a culture where, you know, they've had an, it's a very, it's, you know, it's been an authoritarian culture for thousands of years. And it's also been an, a culture that, um, 
that is very obsessed with memory and with and with creating a story about their past. Um, you know, part of the novel also is about this the damage done by false history. And you see a little clue to that at the very beginning when she, the first time Josie arrives in Egypt when they're having a national holiday celebrating their victory in the Yom Kippur War. And the fact that they actually lost the Yom Kippur War is like irrelevant. And that actually is true. I mean, they do have a national holiday where they celebrate the Yom Kippur War. Um, but in the novel, that becomes sort of a, a marker of like this idea of fault, the damage that false history History does so, um, but that's something I thought about a lot, um, and and actually it's something that I think that I you know I was nervous about presenting it because I I, I will say that um, you know I envision this book as happening not right not now but in the near I, in the near future. And um, I thought I, I know that not all, that readers have not understood this entirely, and I know I, I probably could have done a better job of presenting it because um, I remember reading some review in somewhere in the Israeli press where they said something like, "Oh, this book is taking place in October 2012 because you know she mentions the riots at the embassy and the new parliament." And I'm thinking, well, first of all, they have a new parliament about every 15 minutes, and second of all. There were riots at the Israeli embassy in October 2012, but the reference that I was making was to riots at the American embassy, which hasn't happened, at least not yet. So, um, you know, this was Israelis reading. Everybody reads themselves into a book. Um, but I, I thought that was, you know, what I intended. And, of course, the other thing is that the software that she's created, it doesn't exist yet. I mean, we've come quite close. But we don't have the, the capacity technologically right now to do what this program does, where it's cameras running all the time no matter where you are. And, um, you know, that you can just type in shoes and find all these photos of shoes. Like, we're very close to having that technology, but we don't have it yet. So... My intention was for this to be taking place in the near future, where, you know, where I was, and I was confident that, and the reason I didn't want to put a tag on it, like, you know, in 2018, blah, blah, I didn't want to do that because then I didn't want people, you know, God willing, somebody's going to read this book in 2020, and I didn't want that person to look at it and be like, well, this is dumb because blah, 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 this didn't happen. So I was sort of vague about the times. Um, but what, what I want to say is sort of a, to a larger point about writing about Egypt now, um, Contemporary Egypt. I haven't spent a lot of time in, in Egypt. I I was there as a tourist before the revolution. I mean, like you know, like 15 years ago, a while ago. Um, so I did do a lot of. I spent a lot of time talking to people who had spent time there, and re I read a lot about a, a lot of you know contemporary Egyptian work and stuff like that. I did a lot of research, um, although I had been there myself, but only briefly um, as a tourist. And I would say also that. Um, what I wanted to present with contemporary Egypt, though, was this kind of sibling relationship between civilizations. Um, so you see how, like, in the book, there's many sibling relationships, and in almost all of them, you have one sibling who is more successful than the other, and yet the two siblings are entirely dependent on each other, and that dependence and that that unevenness of their success creates this you know, resentment, which is like this live wire of their relationship. So you see that in the book, throughout the book. But another way that, so you see it with the personal relationships between the sisters. But another way that you see it is with the relationships between the civilizations. So you have Egypt and the West as part of that dynamic of the older, the older sibling and the younger, more successful sibling and the resentment between them. So every time in the book you have Westerners going to Egypt, you have that dynamic in place. Um, you have it when Salman Schechter goes to Egypt between him and the Grand Rabbi of Cairo. You have it with Josie and Nasreen, the librarian. Um, and you sort of have it in a larger civilizational sense of like the British Empire, you know, where, where Schechter goes to Egypt and he sees all these British and German archaeologists who are sort of digging up the Egyptian past and sort of mining it for parts. Um, and you have it in the contemporary time where you have that, you know, they, they, they're the foundation of civilization and yet they have to import these people to run their software for them. Um, and you have that kind of resentment. And then back in the time of Maimonides, you have it going the other way, where now this is a situation where Egypt is the top, on the top of the world, and they're sort of looking down on India, right? At this, like, oh, we have to trade with them, so it's like we're dependent on India, but, you know, those people are, you know, savages or something. So you have that kind of, you know, resentment and yet interdependence between sibling civilizations that's also built into the book. Tara, this is Donna again. Can you say Hi. a little bit more about um, sibling rivalry and, um, you know, at the end of the book, it, it 
it gets transmitted to the next generation. Um, and, and what are you saying there? It's not a happy ending, right? <laughs> I had one, one reader who's like, you know, you model this on the Joseph story, but the Joseph story has a happy ending. I'm like, yeah, the part where they're enslaved for hundreds of years. <laughs> like, I haven't really seen it as a happy ending. Um, it's a temporary happy ending. Well, what I would say about this is the sibling relationships were important to me in the book because they're, first of all, they're kind of a microcosm of this idea of of um, free will versus destiny, right? There's this kind of double helix of free will and fate running through the novel where first things appear to be uh, caused by free will, and then there's sort of like a twist where they suddenly seem, it seems like there's a dominance of some kind of destiny or, or events beyond people's control, you know, beyond the main character's control. Um, and, and there's sort of this ongoing double helix that rolls through the book of those two elements, um, which also rolls through the Joseph story. And I will say that um, the reason the sibling stories interested me was because it's, you see a microcosm of that in sibling relationships, right? Because these are, um, that, that double helix is kind of the nature versus nurture question. You know, how much of who we are is what we is what we're just handed, what we're is something that's innate to us, and how much of who we are is something that we can shape or that our parents can shape, or something that you know is shaped by human choices, by you know acts of human agency. So, and also the question of memory is is very much present in the siblings' relationships because with siblings you have two people who are more than two people who grow ostensibly grew up in the same house under the same circumstances, but you know, looking back on that experience, you would probably, you may never guess that they had grown up in the same house because they have totally different memories of the same events. Um, and so it becomes a kind of a way of looking at a microcosm of that inaccessibility of the past, you know, that there is an objective past. You know, it's not that everything is relative and it all, you know, it's all about your point of view. There is an objective past, but the thing is that we have no access to it because every time we look back at the past, it's being filtered through our perspective of and and, and of our our life in the present. So, in the at the end of the book, um, what I did was like right before the end of the book, this question of free will versus fate seems to be kind of set um, when Josie makes this choice to present her relationship with her sister as a kind of a false history for her child or for her, ultimately for her children, right? She makes this conscious decision to distort the past in the sense or to selectively remember it. And this is something I got from the Joseph story in the Torah because what Joseph says to his brothers when they, you know, when they confront him at the end of the story is, or when he confronts them and he reveals who he is, what Joseph says to them in the Torah, he says, don't be angry at yourselves that you sold me to this place. In other words, like that you sold me into slavery in Egypt. Because it was to save life that God sent me ahead of you. In other words, if they hadn't sold him into slavery, they all would have ended up dying in a famine. I mean, to me, though, this is an amazing revision of history, right? Because, I mean, how can he say, like, oh, you know, don't worry about that whole thing where you sold me into slavery. You know, it's all good. It was just a divine you know, a benevolent act of God. You know, to me, it's like, well, that's, a, you know, that hardly seems fair. I mean, this is, you know, but what it shows, I think, is Joseph's ability to control the past, right? That the way we control the past isn't by remembering everything, but by, but precisely by choosing what we want to remember in order to enable us to have a future. And he makes those choices. He chooses to remember the past in a certain way. So at the end of the book, Josie makes that same choice. She makes a decision about what she's going to remember that makes it possible for her family to have a, to have a future. Now, she thinks she's made this choice as a benefit to her children, but, of course, what she can't anticipate is the, 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 the other side of that choice of creating a false history because then the question at the end of the book when you see this repeating in the next generation, right, that her daughter, who we thought, you know, she sort of wanted her to be more like her, turns out to actually be someone who's more like Judith. And then the question is, is, you know, is this kind of just this destiny? Is this genetic or something that she's sort of doomed to be repeating her, you know, her mother and her aunt's life? Or is it something that could have been averted if she had been told what really happened with her mother and her aunt? Right? I mean, and that's, we don't know, right? I mean, what's happen what we do see, though, is that she, what she's been presented with in terms of the way the past has been presented to her 
is with this impossible standard, right? That these are this, you know, these sisters who gave everything to each other and that one sacrificed herself for the other. And that, you know, there's this truly impossible. And when I say impossible, not just like, oh, no one, you know, I couldn't do that, but that impossible, like it didn't happen. Like it actually didn't happen. This impossible standard has been created. And of course she can't meet that standard. So why should she even try? Um, and so I think at the end of the book, this question is left open as to how much of our lives we can control and how much of it is determined by, by circumstances beyond our control, which include other people's choices. I wanted to give, I wanted to um, be wary of people's time. It's uh, almost 10 to 1. And just to check if anyone has any final um, questions for Dara or for the group um, before we conclude the conversation. Cool. This is so unlike a Brooklyn crowd. <laughs> right. Well, I, so I'll, I'll type in again. This is Donna. Sorry um, to, to make so many comments. I, I love this book, and um, and if there was one thing missing for me, it was the parent story. So I will um, eagerly await the release of your email. <laughs> Thank you. Right, which also will you know uh, raise a lot of these questions again in terms of uh, you know what parents do for children and how much and it's and you know and I think it's something that's a live question in everyone's life, um, whether from the point of view of a parent or the point of view of a child or both. Um, and I think it's something that sort of stands at the heart of the American Jewish experience because the messages we get from Jewish culture and the messages we get from American culture are so different. Um, you know, that American culture sends us this message that, you know, the sign of adulthood is how much you have broken away from your parents and how independent you are of your parents. And I mean, that's sort of like, you know, the, the, sh the greatest shame in an American adult life is, oh, you had to move back in with your parents or something like this, or that somehow you weren't able to separate, or, you know, oh, I went back to work in my father's business, speaking of Edgar Brothman. Um, You know, so that's, I mean, that's sort of like, you know, there, there's something that, so there's something that, that we in American culture that we look down on about that because of our this cultural priority of, you know, everybody has to create their own life without a past. But I think as Jews, we understand, like, just how absurd that is. Um, and as Jews, we sort of, you know, in Jewish culture, you kind of make the opposite mistake in terms of attributing too much to parents and, and sort of saying too much about um you know, and, and uh, sort of downplaying the role of the individual much more. And, you know, of course, you know, life puts us into all kinds of situations that we can't alter and that we can't affect no matter what we do. And we see that very vividly, um, you know, in the parent, in parent child relationships, because I think, um, you know, parents have very deep wishes for their children, which of course can't always be fulfilled. And, um, you know, it's the it's the poignancy of that of those relationships. I think that are um, are so tied to so much of our identity is the way we define ourselves compared to our parents. Um, and I say parents not just in terms of your own individual parents, but also sort of the our parents in a more global sense in terms of um, the generations that came before us. Well, by means by way of closing, I like can't even say how much that touched upon um, an experience that a bunch of us had last week. We had there was a big public um, tribute to Edgar Bronson and three of his sons, and one of his grandsons spoke, and it just touched upon so many of the things that you just brought up, Dara, about how we compare ourselves to our parents in different ways, how we try to live in or outside of their legacy, what it meant for Edgar to you know relate to the legacy of his father and also not to with the complications of their relationship. Um, what it meant for us last week, we learned, uh, we had a Talmud session at the office that Adam Bronfman, one of Edgar's sons, came to where we talked about the relationship between Moshe and our own and what it meant for Moshe, according to um, one of the Midrashim, to actually be the one to tell our own what the day of his death was and to sort of help him die peacefully while also having to relate that to the community. Just a lot of, like, the different dimensions of themes of siblings and parents and children that came up in your book as well. Um, so I just want to thank you so much, Dara, for joining us today and for um, sharing with us about some of your stories and to everyone else for 
joining together also to have this conversation in memory of Edgar. And I hope that, as for always, this is really just the beginning of more conversations on these themes. I know we all have a lot more to say. And I want to say thank you so much for, for, for inviting me and also for, for choosing my book as a way of honoring Edgar's memory. It was really an honor to me to, uh, um, that, that my book was able, you know, that I was able to uh, address so many of these questions um, in a way that was meaningful for so many people. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to explore these questions together. Thank you. And keep us in the loop as, um, as your preface, I think you said, your additional yes, ebook comes out. We would all <laughs> yeah. have to read it. Prequel. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone.